Well, we're going to start. We've got three big sessions in here, and I am, I'm delighted to see that it's a field room already, which is great. I am going to get some more bean bags, so no one has to, uh, has to stand unless they desire to. Obviously, they may need to make a quick exit, but if you want to sit down, there's a few bean bags here, and we'll get a couple more in. I think we've got some spare ones somewhere. So, without further ado, this is our content hub, and what better way to start with a subject and a topic all around content for humanity. Now, to lead this discussion, we've got a, a team of experts here, but our, our man moderator in the panel, thank goodness it's not me this time, is Daniel Fisher, the MD of Europe for PlayBuzz. Thanks. Welcome to our uh, bohemian boudoir. Uh, I hope you're all feeling very relaxed, not too relaxed. Uh, so I think question one should be, how do you manage to look cool while sitting on one of these and not falling off? It's just actually not possible. So thanks for coming. Um, I'm Daniel Fisher. I'm the managing director of PlayBuzz in Europe. For those of you that don't know PlayBuzz, uh, with a platform which enables brands and publishers to tell their stories in the most uh, engaging way possible. Uh, and that engagement leads on average to Nielsen brand uplifts about 12 times, uh, 12 times the average. That's my uh, shameless plug done. So before um, we kick off, I wanted to frame a couple of things and then we'll, we'll have the panel introduce themselves. So the first thing I wanted to talk about very briefly is what do we mean by bad news? So I just wanted to define it. So to me, bad news uh, it's not news that's just disappointing or uncomfortable or difficult, but it's news that's unreliable, uh, told from an ideological perspective, um, and is basically untrustworthy. That's one thing I want to sort of define up front as a, as a guardrail. The second thing I wanted to just define up front is a sobering fact that the average amount of time spent on uh, digital content is about eight seconds, um, and that's a challenge for journalists and for brands uh, who want to tell uh, important stories, particularly in a climate of uh, a lot of bad news flying around. So to answer these questions, we're going we're to have to be quite speedy, but um, I'm de delighted to be joined by uh, Mark, Dominic, Christine and Rianne. Um, and if you could introduce yourselves and also give us potentially your inherent bias uh, within this conversation. Can start this side? Or? It's going to be a lot of passing. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Dominic Chambers. I'm the Global Head of Digital Marketing at Jaguar Land Rover, responsible for content marketing and uh, the web platforms. I mean, for me, content marketing is the most exciting place to be within communications. And um, I don't really have a bias. I just think that uh, as a brand owner, our number one uh, role is to protect the reputation of our brands. So that's where I'd start. Cheers. Hi, I'm uh, Mark Alford. I'm Head of Digital for Sky News. Um, I'm the content guy, I'm not the techie guy. Um, my uh, inherent bias really is that good journalists, um, and I don't mean as in good versus evil, I mean competent professional journalists don't produce fake news and responsible publishers don't publish fake news. Hello, I'm Christine von Hörder. I'm running the global media for Audi. Um, I hope not to have too much of an inherent bias, but my interest is always in how do we really measure what's coming out of content, not only quantitatively in terms of engagement, but also to look at the sentiment and people state after having consumed the content, if they consume it long enough to actually put a statement out there. Hi, I'm Ria Mason. So I head up uh, content across IPG media brands in the UK and EMEA. Um, I guess an inherent bias for me is that I'm always looking for that pull, as opposed to just push media. I'm always thinking about audience first, always thinking about how to drive trust through content, and always thinking about measurement and data, and how to sort of be ahead of the game when it comes to actually making content accountable. Great. And no one actually cares what the moderator thinks, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So my, my, <laughs> my inherent bias is that uh, I think we should measure advertising by other metrics uh, other than CPMs and you know, impressions and things like that. Engagement's a good place to start. So um, let's start off talking a little bit about the idea of bad news. We're going to end on something nice, but let's, let's talk about the bad stuff first, or bad environments. So 20th century, way before, many, many examples of kind of uh, malicious propaganda. But historically, it was always very much, um, you know, sort of nefarious governments lead, leading those efforts. Things seem to be very different now. Uh, with the way that information is disseminated. In 2018, my fact is the Edelman Trust Barometer focused on media being the least trusted institution globally, uh, with search engines being more trusted than editors, Mark. So I think, Mark, you're, we, we'll start with you. What are the challenges for you in telling stories in, uh, in an environment where Google is more trusted than you? I mean, the first thing to say is that there's a huge amount of irony 
in that statement, isn't there? That the, the tech giants who um, are platforms by their own definition and not um, media companies, and they don't have to behave the way that the rest of us do um, in publishing content. Um, isn't it totally perverse that they're trusted more than people whose very profession it is to tell the stories that matter and um, to hold public figures to account? So kind of that's my opening statement. Um, and it's got really difficult um, telling those stories and doing our journalism, but actually um, legacy brands like Sky um, and the big newspaper brands and the other broadcasters actually can benefit from this fake news era um, because just because the President of the United States uses the term to um, indicate his displeasure at a story um, and his supporters uh, uh, caught on to that and, and, and brand it as fake news. That's not actually what they're saying. They're just saying that they disagree with the, that viewpoint. Um, it, it presents real challenges for, for the media as a whole, but those, those trusted brands that are seen as authoritative, um, that have got a, a strong history of breaking news that matters, and. Uh, we, we face those challenges at Sky News by looking internally at our culture, and we came up with some, um, some kind of uh, purpose statements. And the key one that I just wanted to share with the room was that at Sky News, we want to bring clarity um, to our users and our viewers in an uncertain world. And I think we could all probably agree that the world is more uncertain now than it's ever been. Um, and so we send our journalists into the field. We want them to be on the ground reporting the news and showing the news um, to to our audiences. Um, and there is honestly, honestly, honestly a huge amount of objectivity and impartiality in those journalists. They, they, they don't think that they work for Rupert Murdoch. They don't think that they're reporting into Jeremy Darrick. They're trying to tell the stories in the most engaging and honest way that they can. And that's just how, how we go about our business, really. Okay. I mean, uh, Christine, Dominic, I'd be interested to know, um, you know, both obviously representing auto brands. Do you, are you more worried now than before about the environment your advertising is, is, is placed in? What are, the, what are the really big concerns for you right now? Well, I think the, the environment and the context um, is, is more important than, than I think we had recognised in the last five years. I think brands had allowed their advertising to appear in places it shouldn't have been, either because it wasn't, it wasn't even being seen by a human or it was just an inappropriate place which of course in the old media world, we have never have, you know, Jaguar wouldn't have had ads in the, in the Daily Star, for example. I mean, in, in, I think now we are really uh, migrating to quality. We want to be associated with the premium publishers and ensure that our content is seen uh, in a place that is trusted. Yeah, I can't but agree to that. Um, two things from my point of view are important. The association with the right environment, that's something we, we totally agree with. And th that's always been the case. It's just that the media landscape is so much more fragmented that there was a kind of loss of control for a while. I think we're in the, in the process of getting things back on track with technologies getting better and all that kind of stuff. When it comes to trust, and that's the second point, I think media outlets, as well as brands, as well as anything and anybody creates trust over time. It's nothing that just pops up somewhere and uh, you would say, oh, I'm seeing Sky for the first time, I trust them, wow. Um, it's something that comes with experience, with um, having multiple exposures to a brand or to a media outlet. And it has to be proven, and it has to be proven again and again and again in regular frequencies. So those two things together, from my point of view, help a lot in, in actually moving towards, um, well, being a more trusted brand, hopefully, and also to be associated with the right things. Can I ask a question? I don't know if of I'm allowed course. to ask questions. How dare you? Sorry. Um, but it was interesting, the point about um, brands um, and their association with quality media. I'm really interested in where you, you guys draw that line, where, what is quality and what's not quality. Well, I mean, it's partly audience driven, of course. So we're looking for people that um, can afford to buy our cars. So we're, we're going to be in environments where, where they're going to be. I also think that, um, uh, I was just mentioned, the, it's been a very messy marketplace. Uh, GDPR is cleaning that up actually pretty rapidly. But I think more direct publisher arrangements are going to become much more common amongst the big brands. And I think that's all for the good. Just to add to that, um, trustworthy 
media partners are also those that don't just say, hey, come on, give us your, your media budget and we'll just put out there whatever you want us to put out there. Um, when, for example, talking about media cooperations, and we briefly had a discussion about that before this panel started, um, it's very important that also from our point of view and in our discussions, media partners are not bribable um, or that we can't simply say we want you to write this article like this and that so we look better. Um, there's always editorial, um, how would you say that, authority in any kind of title and we would insist on that being maintained. So you, you, you spoke about um, the idea of the brand, you know, that sort of brand equity being built up over a period of time. Rian, do you, do you think that that concept of brand equity is more fragile than it's ever been? I mean, uh, for, for your clients, as an example, and then also from a publishing perspective, yeah. how, how fragile, you know, how much can one tweet totally decimate all of that, <laughs> all of that hard work? Yeah, from a social perspective, sometimes, you know, even just a quick tactical idea can have a big impact. But for me, it's all around the, the power of the planning process. So, as you know, as you talked about, it's, it's about driving trust through multiple interactions. So creating this seamless user experience where we're trying to move somebody from exposure to action. And content can help us do that. But you've got to be there at the right place at the right time with the right message. And I think that's what we find the value in when we think about content and using content to drive trust for our brands as the gatekeeper you know really making sure that we're thinking about all the right elements to make sure that our partners speak to that consumer journey properly yeah, Mark do you, do you think from a some, as a publisher um, you know you have to work harder to maintain with with the amount of noise and other publishers coming in and the fact that anyone can become a publisher very very quickly now do you feel like you have to work harder to maintain that equity that Sky's built over years and years and years of quality journalism? So I, d I don't think we have to work any harder than we did before, but I, th I think we're always working hard, I've got to say that, <laughs> boss, if you're listening. Um, but I think that what's really important is that we recognise that the trust um, in our authority as, an, as a news publisher is really fragile and that if we get something wrong, we have to explain to our audiences um, that we got something wrong and why we got something wrong. Obviously, my preference is that we don't get anything wrong. Okay, um, and I think that that is the fundamental um, sort of difference between uh, a, 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 a trusted publisher and a less tr trusted publisher. I mean, let's declare an interest. I worked for ten years at the Daily Mail before I went to Sky, um, and um, the way that Mail Online um, operates is it just runs out stories and it keeps churning them out and it doesn't really care about um, uh, redress in, on accuracy issues. Other publishers like Sky do. Um, and I think that there's an imp important fact there that it, it's really fragile. You've got to recognize it's fragile. I'll give you an example. So um, the, uh, the uh, street demonstrations during the uh, Catalan independence uh, referendum vote, um, and we carried a tweet um, of the what was plainly priest brute brutality on, 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 on their part and the line in the tweet said um, see this is what you get when you hold an illegal referendum not the best comprised tweet from one of my editors ever um, and obviously um, create a bit of a media, social media storm everybody was saying look agents of Murdoch siding with um, the state etc etc so that, that, small, in a, that small incident and a small mistake by a social media editor creates a whole swirl which kind of breaks down slightly elements of the trust in, in, in our journalism and it's really hard to build it back up but you start the next day and that's what we do. We try and tell stories in a, in a transparent and authentic way. I mean, we, we, I think it sounds like we all agree that publishers, premium publishers, quality journalism remains very important. I think that's quite hard to... Re to refute, how has sort of platform proliferation changed what you do, both in your mar you know, your marketing, the clients that you work with, and the way that you uh, publish? Because obviously, there's been some significant algorithm changes on Facebook recently, which uh, allegedly, you know, deprioritise the the brand message so that things come from more more from users. So it's sort of a more user generated experience or a user shared experience. Do you? Have you seen fundamental differences in the way that you think about your media plans in that world? I'd quite like to pass on the microphone now because my, view, my views on Facebook and the tech giants is definitely one for the bar room. How long do we have? 
Okay, I'll take over then. Thank you. I had no idea you were working for the Daily Mail. <laughs> I'm <laughs> deeply <fine>. shocked. <laughs> Okay, so with regards to algorithm changes, of course it always has an impact on how media plans are built, and I'll pass over to you in a sec, um, and that's pretty much a question of optimization. Um, in our company, there has been some, um, well, buzzwords going around, and probably a lot of you had that as well, where people were saying, oh, let's produce a video, or let's produce a viral um, that everybody's going to see, and it's just going to go around like hell, and we're going to get millions of views. Clearly, that is being impacted by algorithm changes, and clearly that means if we want millions of views for whatever it's worth, and it's not my preferred KPI, um, we need to approach it differently, and of course that would come with a higher share of paid media, um, as opposed to relying on organic or, or sharing or whatever there might be. Um, does it change the contents of what we want to talk about? Honestly, not really so much. It can help to focus, because if you have to spend money for something and if you have to use a part of your media budget, you try to use it for something that's really worthwhile. And overall, it's, it's in a way also helpful because it makes you choose the right pieces that you really want to push in the right way. And uh, you, you stop doing all that little bit here, little bit there, and then story 25 is pushed out as well. I agree. It makes it much more a strategic process. Um, and for us, you know, now we're in that kind of pay-to-play environment, especially with social platforms mm -hmm. in particular. We've had to start thinking about how we build our own sort of creative optimization units. So thinking about dynamic content, thinking about using the paid social um, formats in a really creative way. So whether that's Instagram stories or whether that's you know canvas ads with Facebook, and and trying to bring content experiences and creative experiences into this quite small parameter of, of paid social ad formats. Um, and for us in particular, influence marketing has been a really important step around sort of you know, crowd curated content, UGC content, really sort of having the consumer drive that kind of organic opportunity in social, which still is prevalent and alive and healthy and doing well. So even though the algorithm changes meant that for brands, organic really was becoming very, very minimal in terms of engagement. Influencers um, is still a really, really important channel for us because they still do have that kind of visibility and exposure because their engagement is so high because yep. they've built a really sort of uh, genuine following. Cool. So um, I wanted, uh, how much time do we have left? Is, can we get a time check, roughly? Just so we know. I've got time for questions. Five minutes, okay, so we'll be quick. So Washington Post uh, have uh, like a Trump fact checker. Every time he tweets, it automatically checks. Uh, I think there's probably someone in the background doing it. Um, do you use any sort of tools or products or um, have you got any examples of great work that you've done um, where you feel that you're really sort of giving the counterbalance to, uh, to lack of engagement um, and a sort of difficult, you know, difficult media environment in which to disseminate information. I will say as a quick one, we have been thinking about the role of performance media and content and making sure that any of our creative, we've got multiple variants, dynamic creative, we're starting to really kind of look at the performance of media to make sure content is accountable. And even with influencers as well, we've got lots of different data points and quality checks to make sure there isn't fake following, which is again, a huge issue. Uh, and also that you know the the audience that they've built are, are exactly right. You know we've been working in a in a kind of wild west where we'd work with influencers whose audience were in a completely different market. You know and now we're starting to really put some rigor and some data behind that. So the content we're creating inherently isn't fake. You know or kind of in, in, disingenuous to the campaign we're working on. With regards to the fact checker, I think that's a great thing and uh, I'm very happy that more and more publications are using things like that. Um, it's not an immediate concern for us to be seen in those environments because per se we would exclude certain topics altogether. Yeah. So whether what appears in those categories is fake or not fake is irrelevant because we're not there to start with. Um, a fact checker about advertising would be interesting. <laughs> I was just thinking that. Um, but then most advertising is legally quite thoroughly checked before it's going on air anyway. So probably less of a risk there. Um, so the first thing to say about the Washington Post fact checker is that it was built with a huge stack of cash from Google. So um, <laughs> point, point of clarification there. Um, I think they're clapping that. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah. Um, 
And then uh, I suppose uh, I don't, we don't, in Sky News, we don't have any um, fancy algorithms that check facts. We've got 400 journalists whose job it is to check facts and report the facts. And I suppose the best example that I can um, cite of that recently is uh, the Grenfell Tower disaster, which uh, those of you uh, that operate in the UK will know about. Those of you that don't, I would hope that it reached you, it was a fairly big story. Um, and we've been holding the, um, the builders and the maintenance companies um, to account um, for the way that the cladding was placed on, the, on, on, on that building and um, cost 73 lives. Um, and interestingly, uh, the public inquiry kicks off next week um, into that, so it'll all be in the news again. Um, and that's a really positive way that journalists can check the facts and hold public people and public bodies to account, because fundamentally that's, that's what we're there to do. I mean, I, I just say that uh, clearly brand reputation, where I started, is the most important thing for us. So we'd, we would want to ensure everything we say and do is, is factually accurate. I think, um, back to the content point, um, in terms of paid media, I think sometimes the industry's got a little bit carried away with views and the, and the viral uh, issue because uh, a lot of those people that are uh, watching your film are probably not your customers. So you absolutely need paid media. Uh, and engagements to me is probably the most important metric we use globally for social media because um, if we know we're, we are reaching the right people, we're getting engagement, therefore we're having an effect. Um, so I, I think there still is a long way to go to really make the most of the platforms. I think the algorithm changes are just a continuation of what's been going on. It's not, uh, it is a pay to play environment now, but that's uh, a good thing. Yeah, Do we have time for any questions or are we, yeah? Does anyone have any, any questions? Do we have to pass a microphone? Or? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question about native advertising. So especially the, the clients. Uh, what's your view on that? And uh, what do you think? Uh, does it have any influence on, the, on the, uh, the, the, the journalistic quality of the media, like the integrity? Um, okay, whenever there's content cooperation, so native, native and native are two things and sometimes it's very hard to draw a solid line between what's, what's really native and what is not. From my personal point of view, I think any kind of content cooperation or native, native integration should always be marked as such. If it's not really fully the editorial opinion of the editors. And um, that is something we adhere to in our cooperations. And um, from my point of view, it's the most straightforward and most transparent way to actually clarify that it's also an advertiser talking, even though the editorial team of the publication might be doing the write-ups. Uh, yeah, I've run quite a few native campaigns in my time. And whether that is just native ad placements, it's quite different, especially in a programmatic sense, versus branded content and native integration through editorial or video or uh, collaborative bespoke content. And I think disclosure is hugely important and I think that's an absolute must. And I think for the consumer and for the audience and the reader that's viewing that content, there's actually this element, I think, of respect, but also understanding that native content in particular is actually commercializing the model and actually helping journalists still get paid and keeping that publication alive and well. Um, you know, and I think as long as the publisher is utilizing the same tone, the same voice, the same authority, the same influence, and I think there's a lot of brand equity that can be derived from native advertising, if done right. If you're thinking about the audience needs, the brand's needs, but also, you know, how you actually create the best content experience as well. I think the important thing to stress here is that it's, it, it's not just you guys that are, are being labelled as being different. There's a trend that I think you'll see across um, digital media uh, from the published point of view to label their content better, to distinguish between what is a news story, what is supposed to be a statement of fact, and what is, supposed, what is opinion or analysis or a first-person column. I think that the labelling um, on editorial content is, is going to be clearer and more defined across the business. So a couple of things. One is uh, real editorial is more important than ever. And I think we try very hard as a brand to get real editorial because I think that's worth a lot. I think publications or uh, media outlets should be careful about overdoing it. I was uh, looking on the plane at uh, High Life magazine and nearly the whole magazine was promotions. And I just thought, I don't really want to read this. So I think you've got to be careful not to completely destroy what you've got. Um, 
Uh, and I've forgotten my third point, but there we go. I think, I think that's, uh, that's all we've got time for. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming. Thanks for staying reasonably sort of vertical during the whole thing. It's much appreciated. Um, well, I think we thanks, Rob. Oh, we've got another question. Great. I hope it's royal wedding related. Sorry. <laughs> premature, I prem it is I the prematurely royal wedding. Yeah. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> Sorry, um, just very quickly, I, I, Rupert from Time Magazine. It's, I, I can't tell you how nice it is to hear you talk about the value of context and the value of trust and trust over time. Um, I wanted to just quickly ask. In fact, Dominic, you said about the last five years, there seems to be kind of collective amnesia um, in the value of context, particularly. I just wondered if you had a idea why that happened uh, what was the uh, what well was the I think um, my, my, my favorite phrase is where there's a mystery there's a margin um, and I think pro programmatic uh, absolutely uh, reveled in that now look some programmatic is extremely powerful um, you know uh, so it's not all bad but I think there was a, a, a few bad actors that were taking advantage of people wanting to feel as though they were um, in the game and technically advanced in media and they forgot some of the principles of media and brand management. I think that really is it. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, panelists. Thank you very much. Great discussion there. It was like a, an encore for a gig there. Was it? Come, yeah, give me I more, give me more. It was great. Thank you very much. Big round of applause again to Daniel, Rianne, Christine, Mark and Dominic. Thank you.